go. That's okay. You can still join in on the fun and cheer along. Use your hands and roll them up in a fist as if you were holding a light stick. The fun of it all is always being able to move to the beat of the music and get a hike with the crowd. That's great. I have a light in stick. I just couldn't get it to cooperate with me before I left. Boyage, also known as Olige, refers to a type of dancing and cheering gestures performed by Loda, fans of Japanese idol singers. These gestures involve jumping, clapping, arm waving, and chanting slogans. We're going to teach you a few basic moves today. Mm -hmm. I'm ready. First up, raise your pen light or your hands in the air and tap along with the beat, just like this. Amazing! Up next, during slower or softer sections, raise your pen light or hands up slowly and tap the music before bringing them back down and repeating. You can also cheer and wave your pen lights or hands around during instrumental sections like this. Feel free to also chant. to 
uh, believe in you before you could get any fans on your own. And it's not like that anymore, thank God. Um, so uh, we kind of like to talk about that a little bit and uh, try to help give you guys the tools if you want to be sharing your, uh, sharing your passion, whether it's music or something else. Um, yeah, that's about as, as good as I've got for an unscripted intro to the panel, Caleb, so I'm going to let you... Yeah, <laughs> yes. So, basically, this is your panel, this is your time. If you have any questions related to YouTube, content creation, music, uh, monetization, algorithm, whatever you're thinking about, whatever might be on your mind, feel free to start percolating that brain and we're here to answer the questions as best as we can. We're all learning. That's something in which we are all very much equal in this. The learning never stops. I remember I have a bachelor's degree in media studies, a very nebulous uh, title for a degree to have. Um, and the reason they changed it to media studies was it used to be radio, film, and television. The point I'm getting at is the textbook is always being written, so we're always learning too. So no question is stupid, no question is out of bounds, just uh, whatever you're thinking, we're going to do our best to answer our version uh, of your uh, answer to the best of our knowledge uh, of what your question might be. Or if you have questions about us, that works too, you know, we're, we're open books, I think, for the most part. So, good morning, we'll keep it to see you. I, this, the hammer came in, I think I was like, okay. <laughs> Vaguely, slightly threatening. Um, but whatever y'all are thinking, you just put your hand up, we'll call on you. Um, we're gonna try to do, if you have multiple questions, we'll try to do those in the end so we can give other people a chance to ask the questions. So, whoever wants to break the ice and be that person, feel free to put the hands up and we'll start the questions. Yes, over here, yes. Why does animation have to suffer in the algorithm? Why does animation Good question. Have to suffer in the algorithm? So, uh, I think there's two parts to that question. The first part is that it doesn't suffer in the algorithm, it suffers in some algorithms. So different, um, different websites prioritize different metrics for um, for what they push in their algorithms. So the reason why animation really was kind of pooped on on YouTube for a while is because YouTube started caring more about the number of minutes that, um, that were watched on your channel. Right, so then, uh, but part of the reason why it mattered how fast you could push it out is because the faster you push out videos, the more minutes people are watching, right? Uh, and obviously since animation is such an expensive and time consuming thing to do, if the platform is encouraging the longest content possible on the platform, that's why you have people like PewDiePie and Mr. Beast who have these 30 minute long videos that, that blow up. It's because YouTube cares about the number of minutes watched. Um, as opposed to, there are other platforms like, uh, even like TikTok that uh, don't incentivize minutes watched as much um, so uh, part of what makes part of what we like to talk about on panels like this is that then it becomes a question of okay if you have the knowledge that animation doesn't do well on YouTube because it's not long how can you adjust your process to try and make something as an animator that will work in the algorithm does that mean that you make cheaper, faster animations to try and keep up? Does that mean that you uh, you post short little animations on TikTok because TikTok doesn't care if you only do 30, like, because that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Like, obviously I'm no animator, but um, uh, if animation is a thing where it takes a long time to make even 10 seconds of animation, there's only one platform that loves it when you post 10 seconds and that's TikTok. So mm -hmm. part of the game is figuring out what platform is going to be best for that type of content. You know what I mean? Or what method of animation? Because there's things like tweeting that help take off some time because you have to only have right. one days and you only use it. But there's so many that have to be wrong. Right. Yeah, I mean, I like I said, it sounds like you know more about animation than me. So uh, uh, I admit to inspiring. Yeah, well, keep at it, and 
my advice would just be to think about um, which platforms are going to work best to support the type of stuff that you're doing. You know, because YouTube is great, but YouTube wants you to post long videos. You know. All right. What else? What else we got over here? Yes. Uh, how do you recommend like first getting started? Like, let's say you have zero followers. Like, where do you even begin? Yes. <laughs> you, you you begin. <laughs> yeah, like the best advice, man. Um, it's it's. I feel like the answer to that is going to be pretty something you probably thought of. Um, whenever you're starting out, like at zero, like net zero, I think you try to find ways to find communities that pre-exist that have are adjacent to or directly related to the thing you are making uh, that would have a better chance of taking interest in the thing you've made so if you're into gardening and that's something you want to do and that's like the content you want to make and you have a fun video idea or art you've made there's a lot of gardening communities on Facebook on um, Reddit uh, forums are still a thing, and if you go into those places, get to know some people there too, and then, then basically invite people to check out what you've done. Those are organic, real ways you can get people involved at the ground level. We're talking zero to take an interest in what you do, and then they can spread the word to you like a tree branch that branches off. So I think if you're at zero, it has to be, you know, groundwork and going to places where the people are going to be interested in what you do. Because just posting it into the ether, uh, like on YouTube and hoping, is definitely sort of a waste of your, if you're looking to just get and uh, get some sort of analytical validation, I feel like that'd be a waste of, of time. To spend all this effort and, and emotion and passion on something you love, only to throw it to the wind. You know, put it in front of the people who would be interested in seeing it. It sometimes works though. Just throwing on, I mean, yeah, you should definitely yeah. throw it there, but share it to the place. Yeah. I think one thing that I like to tell people who are starting out, um, I've told a lot of musicians this, but I think it goes for, for any type of content at all. Um, set, like, however you want to do it, I tell people, like, set an alarm on your phone once a day, take five minutes, and just post on TikTok or on, on uh, like whatever, I mean, if you're making longer YouTube videos, obviously it's not that simple, but like uh, if it's YouTube maybe once a week, it's like like set, uh, set like deadlines for yourself and get into the rhythm of like posting something regularly. Because uh, a lot of times, like for example, if you find a certain cosplay community on TikTok or D and D community on TikTok or I like to use the TikTok example because it literally takes like f literally five minutes to pull out your phone and talk about your passion and slam it on TikTok. And if you you know put hashtag D and D on there, there's like for example, there's a huge, huge community of people who just talk about D and D and uh, and post it on TikTok. And some of those people uh, have millions of followers now just from being excited talking about their Dungeons and Dragons game. And if you know about those communities, kind of like what Caleb's saying about Facebook groups, it's like if you find those bubbles and pockets of people that have a common interest to the type of stuff that you're trying to make, you can kind of just start throwing stuff in their direction and eventually something might stick, you know? Um, but I think the hardest part is getting yourself to just start posting stuff and being okay with it, getting 10 views, you know? But. Good question though. Like get the, the starting off stuff, like that's important to consider. And yeah. About is what do you do when you're at zero? You know, the, the ground zero kind of stuff. Yeah, there's not really a right answer. You kind of just have to just start running, you know? But. Uh, let's see, if anyone else have a question? Yes, right here with the red, uh, the red oh. button. Oh, there's okay. Spidey. Um, we'll get you next. Okay. okay, so say you have already started creating content. Um, how do you continually sort of generate, generate ideas for like maybe like your next four or five things? So like right now I'm doing a lot of like time-lapse sketches on 
TikTok and Instagram. Um, do you take? Do you also like? I know. I know that you probably get like uh, content ideas from you know people in your audience because it's big enough now. Oh, what song should I cover next or whatever? And obviously, you guys pick like stuff that you're passionate about uh, doing covers for. But how do you? If you don't have all that yet, how do you generate your ideas for that? Do you do stuff like, oh, the new Spider-Verse movie's coming out. Let me do a couple Spider-Verse sketches because people are already looking for Spider-Man stuff. You, you sound like you you answered your own question. <laughs> that, a little bit. Everything you do, asking your fans and doing what's popular is basically how we do it. If you don't have any fans yet? Uh, well, the, the second part that you said, like, oh, people are probably, like, you're right, people are looking for Spider-Verse sketches right now. People want Spider-Verse fan art, Spider-Punk, Gwen, you know, like, that's what's hot right now, and that would be incredibly smart to, to jump onto that, if, if you're into that, if you're excited about doing sketches of those characters. Yeah, it's difficult. I, I, I understand it's difficult to do a lot of popular things that you may not be too terribly interested in. But I think there is a, there is a, um, art's maybe too strong of a word, but I'm going to use it. There is an art in creating your identity, your uniqueness within the popularity of a property that is being utilized by everybody. Something that is uniquely your appearance, your presentation and you can work that into what you do, so you're not copy-paste. Like, yes, it's, it's okay. good to make really good art of, of Spider-Verse, is the example you gave, but how do you make it you, so it's not just an extremely good piece of Spider-Verse? And I think that's the angle I would look at it, so it doesn't, you know, lead to being like, I wanna, I wanna draw what I wanna draw, you know, but like, how can you still work you into the things that are popular? Because, yeah, that's what I would suggest. Uh, okay. Another way to kind of frame this, question of kind of like jumping off what Caleb is saying. I like to think about it as there's a spectrum of what kind of stuff are you going to make that goes from do whatever the frick you want to chase after the, the bag, you know? Um, so, and, and, and it is a spectrum. You can, it, you can be passionate about Spider-Verse and also be trying to get paid because Spider-Verse is hot right now. Um, but, uh, I kind of like to think about like, know where you sit on that spectrum. Are you trying to make a ton of money, make a fan art of the hottest new Marvel Universe movie or whatever? Or are you trying to be like single-mindedly committed to doing only the art that exists in your own mind of your own passion? And there's nothing wrong with either option, but or or any anywhere in between in the, on the spectrum, but. Um, what what's going to result in you meet, meeting your goals? Do you want to be a niche sort of a cult following artist that does only what you know your own OCs or whatever, or do you want to be rich and only making Spider-Man fan art? You know what I mean? Like yeah, because like that that's like the thing that I think a lot of people don't think about when they're kind of trying to stew on what ideas to come up with is don't just think about what should I do? Think about what is the what is the intended result? You know, because if your goal is to make money as an artist, you should make decisions that go that, towards that, that go towards that. And okay. if your goal is to if you have a day job and you're making content because you love it and not because you're trying to make a whole bunch of money doing s speed sketches or whatever, um, then maybe you don't want to chase after trends. Maybe you want to feel like you have this private integrity to your art, and there's validity to, to, to both mindsets, but you, you gotta pick where you are on that, on that slider, you know? Okay, uh, yeah, that'll probably be my first step then. Okay, yeah. thank you. Great question, though. Yeah, You're Power Rangers. So, mine was kind of a follow-up on your answer from the previous question. Sure. Um, but specifically for music channels and those of us that have full-time jobs, too, um, you talk about you know doing short form stuff once a week and things. Um, what would you do in regards to like music on that? Because a whole video will take you know a long time to produce. So, what is a fast thing you could do with for music? Can I, fast, can I take this what's one? What's a fast thing you can do? Yes. Uh, what's a fast thing you can do to produce? I just a short form. Uh, short form content. How, how do you make short form content when real music videos take a long time? Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. You, you start. <laughs> Go on Caleb's channel and scroll back to 2015. 
<laughs> it'll take a while to go. It, it'll take a while, but but <laughs> this, this guy, it 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 stumped me. But I get it now. But at the time, it stumped me. He built all of his fans turning on a webcam and just singing with no no lights, no no fancy camera. You know, I think he was using. I think this is a more expensive I was using, microphone. I was using a shirt. I was using an SM57. Oh, John, a snaring <laughs> instrument mic meant to mic up. Like yeah, so it, it's. I think it's it's definitely a cheaper mic than this. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, SM57s cost about 80 bucks at Guitar Center, and you could get you could get a cheaper mic. You could get a cheaper mic that sounds better. Now. Uh, so, and I know I know singers. I, I produce music for singers on TikTok now who will literally just pull out their phone. I mean, everybody has a smartphone now. You literally pull out your, your smartphone and just sing or play guitar or whatever it is that you do musically. Literally pull out your phone, hit record, and do it in front of your phone camera, post it. And I, I, I know more musicians than ever who are blowing up with literally, some of these people I've needed to teach them how to use a microphone mm. because mm. their entire career, and they have a fan base of millions of people that was built on literally just singing into an iPhone, you know? Um, and I think that's cool. I used to be salty about that. I used to be like, man, learn how to use a microphone. Now I'm like, Microphones are kind of overrated, man, you know? <laughs> but yeah, let yourself be a little bit scrappy. Let, let yourself be, uh, let yourself, even if it's a little scuffed, even if, it, even if it's not as pretty or fancy as you want it to be, uh, that's actually endearing to a lot of fans on the internet to, to consume music content that is, um, that feels humble, you know? Um, great question. Yeah, that, that just to just to echo, just literally to echo, something about the scuffed. Let it. I like that phrase. Let it be scrappy. I like that because that is what it is. You're talking about being from zero. You're talking about just going and just starting up and kind of getting some traction. Let it be scrappy because people see that. That isn't to say like fake it. Like if you have the means to make something that is in, in terms of quality, you know, uh, uh, up there, like go backwards, but. Like, don't be afraid to have it just be your heart on your sleeve, kind of a, a presentation, and learn as you go. Because to see what he said, like, I did learn as I go. I moved on to other things, but even now I still, the only thing I did was I put up some soundproofing and I'm still using the same camera. I just changed the settings because I didn't know what I was doing. And I got a different microphone and I have some setups, so even my upgrade is still only a little bit from scrappy to like, I can put up a fight. So like that's where I'm. It's you just don't need much, you know. It's I think that's yeah. what it's been proven. Great question. Yeah, super good question. What else we got? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and pick. Uh, far back there uh, with the red brown shirt. Uh, what's your guys' opinion on reaction channels and how like <coughs> the YouTube community has, from what I can tell, in the comments have said things like, "Oh, reaction channels are just stealing people's content." What is our opinion on reaction channels? Um, do, do we deviate? I don't think we've talked about that, you and I. I, I can talk if you want me to start. Um, what do you think? I mean, I have a very, I have a very legal okay. like, take on it. Then maybe you should start. <laughs> <laughs> so, something that bothers me about the discourse around reaction channels is most people don't actually understand how fair use works from a legal standpoint. Um, I, I, could, I could go either way on whether or not reaction channels are like good or bad. I don't really have much of a, I don't have strong feelings about it. Uh, I think that some people on the internet tend to forget that there's a lot of like, kind of like late night talk shows or morning shows on, on normal television that kind of have exactly the same format as YouTube reaction channels. So in a way, YouTube reaction channels are kind of like the natural progression of like the view or, or whatever the, like it's like you're, you're, you're talking about something cool that happened on the internet and reacting to it much like a news personality would react to 
something that happened on a local news station or, or, or talk show or radio show. Um, and that type of media has always been around since you know radio and television were invented. Um, so I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's going to stop. I don't think there's any point in really complaining about it if you think that, that it's bad. But the legal angle, at least for music, is there are laws in place that say if you play a song on in a YouTube video without getting a license for it. Technically, like if, it, if it's my song, let's say, just for the sake of the example, let's say that you put my song in your YouTube video, not my cover song, original song that I wrote, you put, you put it in your reaction video. Um, if my song appears in that reaction video, I am entitled to take royalties from that reaction video because of the way that music licensing works. It does not become a fair use just because like fair use basically says that if you're parodying something or if you're giving commentary on something, then you're allowed to to kind of use um, media that you don't own up to a point. That doesn't count until a judge says so. Uh, so reaction channels can be a great way to like show your personality and, and, and uh, share your knowledge about something, but from a legal standpoint. Um, you can't really monetize it in, in certain, like if, if somebody comes along and says, hey, you reacted to my song, I'm taking all of your money on that reaction video and I don't care if you think it's fair use, you would have to sue them to, um, to, to be right. A, a judge would have to tell you that it's fair use before it becomes fair use. Um, so. I think there's people on both sides of this discussion that just don't know how the law works when it comes to copyright, which can be kind of frustrating. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. But then on the other side, you have people who get mad about that. They're like, "Oh, what the heck? You you claimed my video. Uh, you put a co you put a copyright claim on my video, and this is fair use." It's like. Yeah, I automatically put a copyright claim on everybody that uses my music because if I don't, then somebody will make a, a, a Minecraft Nightcore remix of one of my covers and, uh, and get 10 million views and, and make $100,000 that I, I don't get paid for my work. So it's, it's, there, there's a lot of, I'm sorry, I'm talking in circles, but um, there, there's a lot of nuances to the topic of consent and copyright when it comes to using work that other people made. And I think it's important that you that you research it, that you familiarize with yourself with it. Because even with covers, we get licenses for every cover that we do. And there's laws in place of, that are standardized about how you go about getting a license to sing a song that you did not write. Um, so, uh, and that's something that we had to learn. That's something that we had to, we had to someone had to tell us, hey man, if you want to be able to sell this cover song, you have to get a, a statutory mechanical rate, mechanical royalty license from uh, from a music licensing. You know, like there's um, you, there's a lot of there's a lot of nonsense out there about how all these laws work, and I think that reaction channels exist in this really weird in between place. Um, sorry, that's a long answer. No, I think and that's a, that's a that's why I wanted you to go first every talk about a legal answer because I don't think a lot of people do know about the the legal side, especially with even if the question wasn't about reaction channels, it's about something like fair use is something that is uh, at, at best a lot of people have a general vague idea of how it works. So having a breakdown of that is is important. Um, personal feelings on things like that, I think it operates from there's the legal side and then there's like the unspoken. You know, I think view that a lot of creators have is sort of a uh, scratch your back and I'll, sc sc I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine kind of mentality when it comes to react channels. And it's all honky dory until, at least as I've seen, sometimes they react and they don't, they don't like the thing that you made. And all of a sudden then it's like scratch your back so you won't stab mine kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, I'll ultimately agree with what he said. I think that's the, that, look at it through that lens. Uh, and then, it's fine. I, I think I'm fine with it. Like an example, yeah. like if, if one has like 
nothing, starting out from nothing, and they want to start a reaction channel, or like reacting to, let's say, M&M &M or something like that, how would they go about doing it without getting in trouble on the legal side of things? You will get claims. You will get copyright claims. And there's nothing that you can do to stop that. But uh, if that's okay with you, if you're okay with having every single video that you post get copyright claim, uh, they're not going to take down your video. They're not going to strike you. They're not going to sue you. Uh, you'll be fine. You just won't get any money from the reaction videos. You know? Yeah. Uh, so then, I'll keep this short, but then you got to think about, okay, if I'm trying to make money off this, do I sell t-shirts, do I, you know, like sell posters, like, if I can't make money off of the reaction videos themselves, where is the money coming from if I'm trying to make money doing this? Yeah, that's a great question, though. Really good. What else we got? Uh, what are you thinking? Back here? Uh, kind of sticking with the legal side of things, um, financially, Say you've got a couple of people helping you with the channel. Do you hire them as independent contractors? Do you get an LLC and then you pay them directly and hire them with insurance and all this stuff? Incredible question. All this stuff. Is there a specific type of lawyer that you need to talk to to kind of get stuff rolling? I highly advise hiring as independent contractors. And when you are at the point financially where you feel like an LLC or an S corp is a good idea based on your gross income, uh, definitely do those things. Uh, LLC, once you're making full-time income, I would say, and S-Corp, once you have a bunch of people working for you. Um, I think that something unique about what we do is that we, we usually don't have people on our payroll because we don't know who we're gonna hire for any given project. So I'll have a guy where I'll just, uh, randomly I'll be like, hey, do you wanna record guitar for this? And he's, I don't have him on a, you know, he, he's not my full-time employee. And there, there's a criteria that the IRS will actually give you for this exact topic. They'll give you kind of a check, a checklist of like, do you decide the employee's hours? If not, they're an independent contractor. Do you decide, uh, you, like, you know what I mean? It's like, like, do you force them to work at a certain place? If not, they're an independent contractor. There's kind of like a checklist that you can go through, and almost all of the time, as content creators, the people that we hire uh, don't meet that criteria of full-time employees. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't hire them constantly to make sure that they're making enough money, but, um, uh, and I think, by the way, I think it's very smart that you're thinking about this. Uh, I, not only just to be on top of the financial side of, of doing this kind of thing, but also to, like, outsourcing and hiring other talented people to, to, uh, to elevate your, your content or your art is like one of the best ways that you can grow, so. Precisely, that's, yeah, I don't even, yeah, that's, that's, what, I, that's what we do, you know. But when you, if you get to that next step where you're hiring people and paying for insurance and benefits and the like of that, then you've reached an, an echelon that's, you know, that's, you'll know when you've reached that echelon if you're like, okay, I can pay somebody 70, 80K a year and with the healthcare and for what, like, you'll know when you're there. Like, it, it'll make itself known. But the LLC, escort, independent contracting, all that, co-signed, co -signed all of that. What else we got? Uh, let's see, let's go uh, far left over here in the red jacket. Oh, thank you. Um, how do you deal with something like creative block or low motivation? Creative block or low motivation. Uh, okay. Um, oh. Um, you just do it. You just, you just, that's a great question. How, and I think to, to, to start off, I think that is a different answer for everybody. And I think everybody in this room would have a different answer for how to break through their own creative block. So for me specifically, um, I just, I sit in a room for about six to seven business days and do nothing uh, until something happens that is creative. Um, living life helps too, you know? I think I'm very fortunate at this point in the career to where I can, I can organically let inspiration come about. And I have, the biggest thing for me is I have people in my life that, that restore, that fulfill, that, that 
refuel the creative tank, if you will, so I'm not just alone and doing my own thing. Uh, the biggest thing is, is my family and friends restore me and make it to where this job is easier to do when I burnt out. Uh, so support group is a big one. That's a, that's a really big one. And I tell them the things. I tell them the, the, my, you know, how I'm feeling and what I'm going through. I talk to them. The, the trusted confidants. Uh, that's, they're the ones who speak into me. And that would be my suggestion for everybody is find your people like that, but creatively too, because whenever you can't muster it up yourself anymore, they'll, they'll muster it up for you. And all, isn't it crazy how that works all of a sudden? I know there's a lot of, you know, we talk about, you know, uh, uh, self-improvement or, or self-love and things like that. It's but hard to do whenever everyone around you is being negative. It's interesting how that works, that self-love oftentimes feels like it comes from someone rather than from within. But that's, that's maybe my hot take. But that's how I do it, John. What about you? Uh, creativity is a muscle. And if you want to be good at... at at lifting heavy weights creatively, you got to work out those muscles. And uh, treating it like a job and keeping track of how many hours I work on my art every day was very helpful to me. Um, because, like, there will be, I mean, it, it's just like, if you're, um, like, even, even singing, like singing, like your vocal cords are muscles, or like guitar, like, you know, your fingers and the muscle memory and the, the discipline, that those are muscles, like it's kind of like being an athlete. And if you think about, if, if you, I really like kind of the metaphor of just treating yourself like an athlete. And if you're a, you know, a, a swimmer or a marathon runner or something, you know, I'm sure, and I'm sure that there's marathon runners that show up to the marathon and they're like, man, I'm really not feeling like running today, but they still run. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the most important part of my perspective is, is like, uh, like yeah, you're gonna, there are gonna be days where you feel like crap and you don't want to work on music or you don't want to work on art or content, but the, the people that win the marathon are the ones who still run, you know, so. Great question, really good yeah. question. Uh, let's go middle, what are you thinking? Uh, yeah, right there. Uh, what is currently the most difficult video each of you have worked on? Most difficult? Um, I was going to say, I think I know yours, but it depends on what you would consider as a difficult, what your perspective on difficulty would be. Um, I would say the most difficult cover for me is any time I've done big collaborations, because half the time the funny part is when I do collaborations or new work, the hardest part is not actually the singing. Oftentimes it's the working with everybody, working with large groups of different personalities, different schedules, and the trying to, the, the, the biggest muscle I've flexed in this job is not my vocal cords, it's my, it's, it's my aptitude for understanding people and their schedules and having to constantly be understanding and say, I get it, that's okay. We can give time. Uh, the, the the grace muscle is 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 uh, if it were if I were a bodybuilder, I feel like I would look massive. Um, not even by choice; it just happens. It has to be that way. I'm a uh, bodybuilder from love. <laughs> uh, so any of my I don't want a particular project in, in general, but like if you go to any of my collabs with lots of people, um, those are some of the most difficult and challenging um, for. Vocally, often they are challenging. They present difficulties because of all the parts that are needed, and uh, they're difficult for the mixers and the instrumentalists because there's a lot going on. Um, and then there's difficulty in uh, just the interpersonal communication for each individual unique person, and speaking to them and talking with them in a way that works for them. So uh, that's my answer. It's not a particular project, but a swath of that. Piggybacking off of what Caleb said, um, personally, for in terms of the work that I personally had to do, my most difficult video was uh, definitely Hellfire, um, because there's, uh, that was kind of when I started to really lean into, there's a lot of things that I had to learn how to do that aren't singing, and like especially like 20, 30 years ago, like being a singer, you sing, and that's kind of it. Like you don't, you don't really have to uh, typically 
um, you don't really have to typically learn very many other things. You can just focus on singing. But like for the Hellfire video, there was like acting and video editing and lighting and filming and, and, and color correcting and all these different things that I kind of forced myself to learn how to do. Um, so it was a lot of work, and it was a lot of work, similar to what Caleb's saying about how there are a lot of things that he did off screen. Um, it was kind of the same thing, where there are a lot of things that I did for that video personally that were not directly related to the, to the singing, the song itself. Um, in terms of most difficult video, not necessarily measured by my own personal work, it would definitely be the Starship Velociraptor video, um, which, yeah, which took two years for Volta Animation to animate. Uh, and he had never done a music video before, so he basically like created his own new workflow for that video. And that's another, another valuable lesson that I've learned, similar to the question this gentleman asked, um, is uh, I didn't give Volta any, anything in, in terms of direction. I basically, uh, and it was tough for me to get to a point of trust where it was kind of just like, okay, like, this song is my baby, but now this video is your baby. And I'm trusting you to, like, be an artist and run with it, and I'm not gonna look over your shoulder or tell you what to do, I'm gonna let you uh, turn this into something. And, that may interrupt you, but finding those people that you, yeah. can, that you can do just that with is so hard. Yeah. That's like finding a diamond in the rough. And, to find those and when you do find those people, stick with them, you know? <laughs> because, uh, and, and you will, I mean, I don't know, this is, I'm taking this question in a little bit of a weird light. That's fine, like that's fine. Soccer coach direction, but uh, <laughs> like uh, you, you will run into people and artists and, and other you know colleagues that will uh, flake on you or suck or communicate badly or even treat you like crap, and that's life. But eventually, you'll meet people that respect your art, work with you well, and um, and elevate you. And the best that you can do is hold on to those people for dear life because they're gonna. Uh, sometimes those finding those people having the right video editor can make or break a, you know the, the next chapter of your career having the right um, the right mixing engineer if you don't mix your own music having the right person mixing could make or break whether or not an album you know blows up or not having the right artist to make the thumbnail or the album art whether that's you whether you know you learn how to make thumbnails yourself I we talk about that a lot how literally how good a thumbnail is can decide your fate as a YouTuber. Uh, and that's not, you know, I'm, I'm glad I got to mention that because it's one of the one of those things, it's like, okay, uh, you got 50 bucks to throw at a graphic designer, or if not, go learn a free version of Photoshop, you know? Like, th those are your choices. You like, or, you know, there's some people that don't really do thumbnails, some people that just will allow YouTube to automatically, but that's, yeah, yeah, anyway. Great question. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, we got we got time for I think maybe two more, or maybe we can speed run it. Uh, Luigi in the back. Um, what is your guys' opinion on the YouTube shorts? Uh, speed run that question. Uh, we're still learning. We're kind of like the old dogs who are trying to learn new tricks on YouTube. Uh, but the channels that I see that are doing the best right now are the channels that are taking full advantage of YouTube shorts. So I would highly recommend that you take YouTube Shorts seriously if you're trying to trying to do well on YouTube. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, yeah. This gentleman has been waiting for so long. Yeah, just uh, just wondering now that you uh, going back to a question you answered before. Uh, how do you go about getting a license if you're going to do a cover of a song or something? Yes. So there are music distributors. There are free music distributors that you can sign up with. I recommend SoundDrop. Um, uh, there's also Two Lost and DistroKid are also uh, also companies that you can use. All of them will allow you to submit a song to them to go through to Spotify and everything. And you can check a box that says this is a cover song. Here's who wrote the original song. I'd like to pay a fee of five dollars to license this song, and they'll handle everything for you. Cool. Thanks. 
All right, what else? We're doing a good job on the right here. Uh, in the back, glasses, uh, red, 72. orange. Yes, yes. yes. How did you guys go about like, establishing your brand? You know, because like, a lot of people do the same thing, so like, at what point did you like, separate yourself from other people? It's like an evolution in a way, right? Like it's not, it's not, not it wasn't yeah. immediate. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always gonna be changing, but I, I think one thing that helps me is to think about your priorities. Some people's brand is that they don't care about their brand. Like it's, yeah. it's kind of like, like, like some people's brand is that like, I don't have good looking thumbnails, I look like crap, I'm just singing into my iPhone. Like that is some people's brand. And other people's brand is they don't post anything unless it looks like a flawless, picture perfect, you know, perfectly lit music video. And part of it is just a personal question for you about like, uh, you know, is it important to you to look hot on camera or is it important to you to, to strip away all of the, the glory and, and glamour and, and, and just, uh, you know, close up on a guitar as you play a guitar part, or do you want to look like a, you know, super cool with the wind blowing in your hair while you're playing guitar, you know, like, those are kind of two different things. Um, and, you know, some people will, some people will, like, play guitar on YouTube and just put Comic Sans fonts up and, and, and kind of look dumb on purpose, and other people will have, like, perfectly, you know, uh, uh, Adobe After Effects, you know, the, the most trendy font that you've ever seen. Like, you, you gotta make those decisions and, and uh, run in a direction that, that you feel suits your own uh, career and think about like what, what uh, who, who do you want people to see you as? You know, do you want people to see you as flashy and, and uh, glamorous? Do you want people to see you as kind of a dork? You know, like, there's no right answer. It's, it's it's you, you know. All right, we got time for two more, and then we'll have a, like a, a debrief. Uh, let's see over here on the right, uh, glasses. Yes. Um. So this is probably a that question maybe a bit more towards you, but uh, so you've done covers for a while, but in the last like year or two, you released a few of your own original like albums and tracks. Um. So, as a content creator, how did you get to a point of, uh, or bring yourself, work yourself up to a point of being able to put out your own original stuff instead of following precisely what the community kind of like was hoping for? I well, I think we, we both have we both have thoughts on this, and I, I might make that the last question, and then uh, and I'll say what I'm going to say before answering this. We're going to go right to our table in the dealer's hall right after this. So if there are any questions that you guys have that are pressing or you wanted to know about it, we're going to yep. be selling merchandise and CDs and t-shirts, and we can answer your question there. If you we're want. right next to the voice actors. Correct. And say hi. We have tons of merch. Get it before it sells out after our show tonight. We'll be there for a couple hours. That is very true. Um, so to answer that, uh, and I know you have thoughts too, uh, the, it, the covers were not necessarily a means to an end because I've been singing covers for a long time. I really enjoyed it, even before they ever became popular. I just loved singing songs. Um, but then I found a passion for songwriting and started working it way and slowly into my content because I'm not trying to push away my audience that came to see me because of the covers, because of the, the thing they came for, Steven Universe, or if they came for Disney or anime. But I can at least put out there every now and then a little bit of my heart on my sleeve and just suggest that you come see my original stuff. And if I even get 10% or 5% of the usual people, you know, I adjust my expectations for when I release original works. Um, and slowly but surely, we've had some success through you know, targeted marketing, through uh, the posts and what we're making to try to advertise it to people, we're starting to build up an audience that's interested in, in who I am and what I do uh, in my voice. Uh, so it's just been being enabled by people who care about what I feel and think and sing, and then being enabled by an audience whenever I will YouTube community post or say, hey, would y'all be interested in hearing an original song? And then getting just enough of an encouragement and validation to try. Uh, so it came over time. Um, after building that audience and, and showing the care a little bit. Yeah. Are you familiar with Nerdcore? Uh, okay, so this is kind of, a, a, kind of want to take a, a different angle on, on this question. Sure, sure. I think this is a really good question. Um, 
Uh, I mentioned earlier this kind of spectrum between like doing whatever the heck you want, regardless of how much money it makes, and uh, chasing after trends. Um, for me, cover songs were always, I need to make money, I'm gonna chase after trends. Uh, but at any point during your career, you can move where you are on that spectrum as long as you're aware of the consequences. As long as you're aware that like, if my fans that I've built up doing anime covers aren't interested in my pirate metal originals, that's something that I might have to face. That And, and I might make less money, but what's it worth to me, you know? Um, but something that I would encourage you guys to think about as kind of a closing thought, because uh, even though this, this is the greatest time ever to be a, an independent uh, content creator, artist, whatever, um, obviously, we, we're not, sadly, we're not in a Disney movie where like you can't always just do exactly what you want to be doing artistically and make a lot of money, you know, sadly. Uh, sometimes you have to make compromises, but um, if you're clever, you can find loopholes. And for example, like I have friends who are rappers who are very passionate about rap music and they'll just make rap songs about Naruto. <laughs> and it kind of, uh, I don't want to use the word clickbait, but like it kind of attracts the same person that would click on a Naruto cover, but they get to express themselves and write their own original lyrics as a rapper and still pull in the Naruto fans that would normally just be looking for like covers. So you can kind of like outsmart the system and kind of uh, appeal to, you know, and even like, um, some of these same people are making rap songs about Amazing Spider-Verse now, or the, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the Spider-Verse movie, and it's like, it's, I think it's genius, because they want to be writing original music, but they recognize that people aren't always just going to click on an original song uh, as much as they would if it was connected to, you know, this is inspired by Spider-Verse, and Spider-Verse is trendy right now, and now it's gonna go through the algorithm better. So there's there's ways that, like, whether you're a painter or a, a singer or whatever, um, I think if you're smart, there are ways that you can kind of, um, you, can, you can find a way to express yourself while also kind of being smart about how you're marketing yourself or what you're writing about to, to try and make money. Um, and we're, we're still learning how to do that. We're all, we're all in this together, figuring out how to, um, how to make money and to also do what we love. Uh, and hopefully, you know, hopefully this is a little bit helpful to, to you guys to feel the confidence and feel like you have the tools to, to start doing this sort of thing. And, and we believe in you. Come and say hi to us at our merch hall table, guys. We'll be there for a couple hours, so yes. come and say hi, guys. Thank you for coming out.
you have it. <laughs> See, we're setting a high bar for our bits today. I know you know this song. It is from a movie. Small, small Andy Studio. Yes, yeah, Small Andy Studio.
Let's slow it down for a second. Is this one awesome?
Ha, ha, ha.